Today's message is not going to be some deep spiritual revelation, some outstanding thought that might make you say, wow. But I, I feel this on my heart, and it's probably been a long time since I prayed or preached along these lines. And so I want us to receive what the word of the Lord has to say today. Matthew chapter 6, verses 25 through 34. Therefore Jesus said, I say unto you, take no thought for your life what you shall eat or what you shall drink, neither yet for your body what you shall put on. Is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment? Now, Jesus in this first verse is hitting right where we live because we worry what we're going to eat. We worry what we're going to drink. We worry what we are going to put on because that affects our, our man, our natural man. You know, you can always find a place to sleep. It might be under a tree somewhere. It might be under a carport somewhere, maybe in a car somewhere. But when it comes to eating, when it comes to drinking, when it comes to clothing, that is right down where we live, amen, more than anything. And then Jesus goes on to say, Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. And then Jesus asks us the question, Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, can add one cubit unto a statue? Can you make yourself grow any taller than what you really are? And, and then why, he said in verse number 28, take ye thought for raiment. Why do you worry about your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say in you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Think about it. The, the royal robes of royalty that Solomon wore with all the colors that were intertwined, the gold, the silver, the purples, the blues, the reds. The Bible says even in all his glory, the way that Solomon was able to dress, amen, that the lilies of the field were so much more glorious than he was. So wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Shall he not much more clothe you? Amen. O ye of little faith, therefore take no thought. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't think about it. What we shall eat or what we shall drink or wherewith all shall we be clothed. For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. Now, now notice Jesus is talking to the Jews, and he mentions the word Gentile here. After these, the Gentiles seek. Now, did not the Jews worry about these things? Well, yes, they did. But when Jesus refer, was referring to the Gentiles, he was not referring to the Gentiles as the way we automatically would think. He's talking about the heathen in general. So what the Lord is saying to Israel, don't, don't be like the heathen. You have God. They don't have God. You have the knowledge of who he is. They don't have the knowledge of who he is. God walks with you. God reveals to you. God shows you great and mighty things. He is with you. The Gentiles, they don't have their God. They've got false gods, but they don't have the true and living God. So don't worry. Don't follow the thinking of what the Gentiles think and what the Gentiles seek because they don't know truth. They don't live in truth. They, they don't understand the revelation of who God is and what God can do. And so he said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for tomorrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. And I, I want to ask this question, or maybe not a question, but let's make this statement. Why worry? Why worry? Amen. Why worry? Brother Jackson, kick lighter, would you pray over the word? in your truth, Lord, bless the man of God as he delivers the word to us. Yes. Open our hearts and our minds and our spirit to your word. In Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. You may be seated. Why worry? Before I even start this sermon, I just want to ask a question. How many of you have ever worried about anything? Raise your hand. 
Now, let's, let, let's see some honest people here today. We, we all have worried. And in the midst of your worrying, did it ever change anything? Did the worrying ever change anything? And if you want to be honest, when you worried about something, it amplified the thing that you were worrying about and made it probably even seem worse than what it really was instead of making it feel better. So you had to fight doubly hard to get through it. So why worry? Why worry? And I think we all, as I just mentioned by the raising of our hands, amen, we all have worried at times, and I'm sure and I'm just going to just be honest with you, since we're human, there are going to be times in the future that we're going to worry. Amen. Now, that does not mean we, we, we can worry, we should worry, but it's just a fact of life. There are going to be times that we are going to worry. And when that spirit of worriness begins to afflict your heart and soul, maybe you can remember some things that I'm going to share with you today. Now, when we begin to worry, when we really begin to worry, what does it do? It begins to consume us. It becomes our center focal point. It becomes the fuel behind our drive. It becomes the fuel behind our ambition. This worrying becomes the engine, if you will, of our life. And as I said a moment ago, when we begin to worry, Amen. It does not change the outlook. It does not change what's going to happen. But in reality, it can make, seem, make things seem a lot worse than what it really is. And so when you worry, what is happening? You are beginning to fixate your attention. You are beginning to look at what is consuming your time, what is consuming your energy, what is consuming your passion, and you're fixating your spirit upon it. Amen. And instead of blessing you, instead of helping you, instead of strengthening you, it begins to draw your strength. It begins to draw your joy. It begins to draw your faith out of you. Amen. And it begins to leave you empty. And then when that happens, it begins to spiritually paralyze you, that you become a robot, so to speak, the joy and the peace and, and the, the spirit that God wants you to enjoy, amen, and tap into because of worrying and frustrating over a situation and looking at that situation, you become spiritually paralyzed. And then what happens you begin to wrap chains around your life and your heart without even realizing it. In other words, you bind yourself. It's not the enemy that binds you. It's not the world that binds you. It is not your friends that bind you. You are binding yourself because you begin to worry. And so one of the things that we may worry about is, what if I make a wrong decision? Because we know that if we make a wrong decision, it can affect our future plans. It can affect our future life. It can affect our future outcome. And I'm sure, I know in my years of living, I made a few mistakes that were, I made a few choices that was the wrong decision to make. Amen. And even though I did not suffer from it uh, in a catastrophic measure and in a catastrophic way, there were still repercussions because of a decision or two that I have made without seeking God, without calling upon God and asking God for direction, asking God for help, asking God to pour out his blessing within my life. So we worry about, what if I make the wrong decision? And then what some younger people worry about is, what if the desires of my heart, what if the dreams and the passions and the goals of my life never come to pass? Will people look at me as a success or will people look at me as a failure? Let me tell you something. You don't need to allow this spirit to encapsulate you, amen, that you cannot enjoy, you cannot live, you cannot fulfill your dreams and your goals. And if they don't come to pass, it's not going to be a deal breaker. It's not going to be the end of the road. And you need to understand that we cannot measure success in our spiritual life like the world measures success. 
People in this world measure success by how much money they make, what kind of home they live in, what kind of car they drive. But yet the people that are living in those very nice homes, that are driving those very nice cars, that are, 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 are dressing in those very fine clothes, amen, I'm talking about the stuff that's way up here, they worry too. They worry too because they're worried, well, what if I make the wrong decision and I lose all I've got? You know, some of us, we don't have much to lose, okay? Amen. But if we had, say, 75 acres and a 10-bedroom house on the edge of a pond somewhere, and we were driving a Lamborghini or a Mercedes-Benz or a Ferrari or a Rolls-Royce or, you know, some exotic car, and we wore $2,000, $3,000 suits, oh, yeah, they could not comprehend what it would be like to go back to a Ford or to go back to a Chevrolet, or go back to a Nissan, or whatever else it may be. So in reality, worrying does absolutely nothing for you, especially when you live for God. And so then we ask the question, do you ever wish you could just stop worrying and fixating on things you cannot control? Oh, we say, I, I wish I, I didn't have to worry so much. I wish I can overcome, amen, uh, not worrying so much. I, I wish I can break this habit of worrying so much. Is there any chance? Is there any possibility? Is there anything that I can do to stop worrying? And I've got the answer for you. How many want to know the answer? I'm going to give you the answer. The answer is yes. You can get to the place that you don't have to worry. You can get to the place, amen, that you don't have to be fixated on things that you cannot control. And Jesus gives us the answer, amen, that will stop all worrying. Are you ready for it? Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. But seek ye first, number one, the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all, all these things shall be added unto you. What we shall wear, what we shall drink, amen, what we shall eat about my dreams and my goals and my passions. When we stay, oh, hallelujah, here's the key. When we stay before the cross, we stay on our knees, we stay, amen, with our attention fixated upon him. Whatever happens, whatever comes, whatever goes, if we make good or we don't make good, as long as as I am under the shadow of his wings, I know my God is going to take care of me. I know my God is going to see me through. Amen. Now, I'm not saying that when you do that, all problems exist or, or cease to exist. All problems become null and void. I, I would be foolish to say that because while you're fixating upon the kingdom of God, the devil's going to try to throw things up in your life to get your eyes off the kingdom of God. For you see, when our focus is on the world, amen, when your focus is on the flesh, when your focus is on the things or the things that are going on around you, amen, worry is going to be the usual result. You cannot change a thing. You cannot change the outcome. But when we focus on Jesus and we draw our attention to the cross, then that is going to change everything. Well, how does it change everything? Because it changes us. It changes us. It changes our outlook. <coughs> it changes our thinking. It changes our heart. It changes our passion. It changes our desires. It changes our wants. And so Jesus told us in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is the Sermon on the Mount. He calls us to seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things, amen, are going to fall in to place everything from A to Z, they are going to fall into place. I don't care what it is, it's gonna fall into place. You may say, Well, brother, use pan, refrigerator's empty. I don't get paid the next week. Seek first the kingdom of God, God will make a way. I don't know how He's gonna do it, but God's gonna make a way. I've shared this testimony, amen. Right after my wife and I were married, 
I was working at the church, and I think I got a pay raise of $150 a week. Amen. I was making 75 before I got married. Now they raised me up to $150 a week. Amen. And so we were we had an apartment to rent, we had a car payment to pay, we had utilities uh, that we needed to pay. And so that $150 a week didn't go very far, as you can imagine. And so we were down to, I think, our last two or three dollars. And my wife went down to Walmart. This is when Walmart just broke into Savannah. Right? What, Walmart? What store was it? Kroger. Kroger? Okay, well, I thought it was Walmart. Well, I'll take that back. That's when uh, Kroger came into Savannah, Georgia. She was going up and down the aisle just looking for something that we could afford to eat because Mother's Cupboard was bare. And as we were, or she was, I was home. Amen. Pushing, the because I don't go grocery shopping with my wife. I'm smart. Amen. I stay out of the way. Amen. As she was pushing the grocery cart down the aisle, on the floor, she found a $20 bill. She found, and I believe, if I remember correctly, you took it to the front desk, amen, to see if anybody claimed it. Nobody claimed it, amen. So she took that $20, and she brought us, she purchased, amen, some grocery for us that we could eat. Why? Because God saw a need, amen, and God used somebody, I don't know who it was, to lose a $20 bill that my wife could find a $20 bill, amen, that would feed us for the next two or three or four days or however long. It lasted. God's good. Another time, we were appointed by the Georgia District Board to go to Swainsboro, Georgia for six months. The church there in Swainsboro was on its last legs as far as the district board was concerned. And so they said, Brother Yuzapan, we want you to go in. We want you to knock doors, teach Bible studies. Amen, for six months, and then we are going to reevaluate everything. And I think they gave us $600 a month. And so that was to pay my car payment. And they said, now, we don't want you to use this money, amen, for church bills. And I said to myself, if I don't use this money for church bills, how's the light bill going to get paid? How's the water bill and the gas bill at the church going to get paid? So beside that, it, it had to pay our bills. It had to pay the church expenses, what little they were. And, and during that time, for whatever reason, I got sick over a couple of weeks. I think it was because of uh, the natural gas burning in the um, little side heaters that we used to have back in those days. Amen. Not burning, combusting completely. And, and so I uh, wasn't feeling well. And beside that, we were told you can't even have a part-time job. You got to do this. And so we were out knocking doors. We were out passing out tracks. We were trying to invite people to church to get something stirred up. And once again, mother's cupboard was bare. Mother's cupboard was bare. We didn't find any money that time. But there was a knock on our door. and I forget who it was. And they brought us over some deer meat. Amen. And we ate off of that deer meat for a week. Amen. And you may not like deer meat. I like deer meat, thankfully. Amen. But for a week, we had we had deer. Amen. For our dinner. Amen. For six or seven days in a row. Why? Because God supplied a need. Oh, it would have been nice to go to Western Sizzling and get a steak. It would have been nice to even to be able to afford to go to McDonald's and get a hamburger. But amen. God sent us some deer meat, and that's what we ate. So I'm here to tell you, when we trust God, when we believe God, and we seek first the kingdom of God. Why should we worry? Focus your attention upon the Lord because my God will add these things. You say, well, what things? Well, let's go back to what we have read, Matthew 6, 25 through 30. Therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat or what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is life not more than meat and the body than raiment? God understands that, amen, meat is going to sustain life. Bread is going to sustain life. But he's saying your life is even more important than meat. And if your life is more important than what you eat, don't you think that God is going to see you through? And you got to have clothes. you got to keep warm when it's cold out. Amen. You got to protect yourself with raiment so life is even more important than that. But without it, you can get deathly sick, especially in the wintertime. But God tells you, hey, trust me, 
believe me. And then he gives the analogy about the birds. They don't sow, they don't clock in, they don't clock out, they don't reap, they don't gather in the barns, but your heavenly Father feedeth them. Some would say, well, then that means I can sit home all day long and sit in my easy boy chair and God's going to take care of me. I don't have to do anything. No, the Bible also says if you don't work, you don't eat. You don't work, you don't eat. But I'm telling you, what I'm telling you is when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, amen, you may be doing what you can do. And sometimes, let's just face it, the ends don't meet. Amen. We've all been there. Something pops up. Something happens. Amen. There's a change of course. There's a change of plan. There's a change of direction. How am I going to work this out? Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. Listen to me today. Seek first the kingdom of God and trust him. Trust my Jesus because the Bible tells me we are better than the birds of the air. We are much better. And if God takes care of them and we are of more value to him, don't you think that God is going to take care of you? Don't you think that God is going to see you through? Don't you think that God is going to make a way where there seems to be no way? He says, don't even worry about your raiment. Consider the lilies of the field. They grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. They don't worry. They just, they just enjoy the sunshine. And then he said, if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast in the oven, thank God it's getting close to that time that the grass is fixing it. We won't have to mow for a while. Amen. But God takes care of the grass of the field. Shall he not more clothe you, O oh, ye of little faith? O oh, ye of little faith? So when we worry, our faith is not growing. When we worry, our faith is not developing. When our faith, amen, when we worry, we are hindering our faith. But when we seek God and we seek the kingdom of God first, then God is going to do it. God is going to perform on our behalf because our faith says it will. Jesus gave an astonishing reminder in the Sermon on the Mount that where your mind and your heart is, that is where your focus is going to be. But you say, well, where does it say that? Did not Jesus say, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be be also, amen. So if we, if our heart is focused on the earthly, if our heart is focused on the worldly, then that's where our, that, that's where our thinking is. That's where our treasure is going to be. But when we think upon God, when we draw upon him, when we love him, when we exalt him, when we magnify him, and we are seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things are going to be added unto you. We don't need to stress ourselves out, folks. You hear me? I said we don't need to stress ourselves out. Now, I'm going to make a statement, and I know maybe for some people it's going to be a touchy statement, but that's okay. I don't mean to be rude. I don't mean to be hateful by the statement that I'm going to make. But I firmly believe that if we are the child of God who we say that we are, then we will never face a nervous breakdown. Why does, it have, why does a person have a nervous breakdown? Think about it. Because they are so overwhelmed and they are so consumed with worry and strife. You say, well, I, I knew a person that had a nervous breakdown and they loved God. I'm not saying they didn't love God. I'm not saying that at all. But their faith was not at the point and the place that they were seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. They allowed these other things to step in between, amen, them and their God. Because if God is the center focal, and here's the premise of why I believe this, amen, if God is the center focal point of their life, amen, where your treasure is, there is where your heart's going to be also, amen. So if my treasure is Jesus, my heart's going to be there, amen, and he's going to give me the peace of mind. He is going to give me the peace of heart that no matter what I'm going through, amen, my God is going to 
to see me through. And my God is going to keep my mind. Amen. He's going to keep my heart with perfect peace. Once again, I'm not, I'm not disparaging them, and I'm not saying they're and I'm not even saying they're backslid. What I'm just saying is they have allowed other things to get in their way of seeking first the kingdom of God. Now, if you don't want to agree with me on that, that's fine. You know, we'll we'll still love each other. But we need to understand that a wrong focus leads to a wrong state of mind. A wrong focus leads to a wrong state of mind, which leads to anxiety, amen, which leads to worry. So let our treasure, amen, be what is our treasure. That's where our heart is going to be also. So that's why Jesus could say in Matthew 6, 25, therefore I say to you, take no thought for your life. Take no thought for your life. Easier said than done, right? Absolutely. Easier said than done. But it's a word from Jesus. And if Jesus has spoken that word to us, and guess what? Through the power of the Holy Ghost and through the Word of God, it is something that we can do. It is something that we can accomplish because Jesus is not going to put on us more than what we're able to do, and he's not going to require something of us that we cannot do. Maybe in our flesh, maybe in our natural man, maybe in our carnal man, we cannot do it. But yet through the power of the Spirit, what did Paul say? Philippians 4, 13, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. So he said, he said, I say unto you. Why did he say that? Because he wants us to pay close attention to what he's saying. Take no thought. For your life. Amen. So let's not lose fact when we read that, that we're hearing the words of the creator, the one that created the world into existence, the creator of the universe, the one who put the stars in the place, the one that created man, amen, that holds the world in the palm of his hand. If he has that authority, if he has that power, if he is omniscient, if he is on my present, if he is on my potent, and he said, take no thought for your life, then should we not do what Jesus said? If he controls everything that's going on, amen. should we not do what he said do? Should we not do what he said to do? Take no thought. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. And you would think that that would be enough to cure us on not worrying. Amen. But yet, we do worry. Why? Because we have allowed our mind to focus and live in disbelief. Because I don't see no way out. I don't see anything happening. I don't see how this can come to pass. I don't see how I'm going to be able to fulfill this or do that. Amen. The point is, when your life and my life is centered in Jesus Christ, we will find all that we need. We will find all that we need. The problem is, or I should say, the problem is not we have a concern for our spiritual needs. But what we do is we let the physical needs take over and run priority over the spiritual needs. If we could turn that around and recognize our spiritual man and the spiritual needs of our life need to be the number one priority, then everything else is going to fall right in behind. That's why Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. So that's why Jesus was telling us that life is more than food. Life is more than clothing. Amen. Life is more, amen, than even breathing ourselves. Because we won't have to worry about life when the life seems to be so overwhelming. Why? Because I know my Jesus overwhelms the overwhelming. Woo, that's a good thought right there. I'm going to say it again. And I just thought of that. I didn't copy that from somebody. When life seems overwhelming, Jesus is overwhelming over the overwhelming. When we are overwhelmed, let Jesus overwhelm the overwhelming in your life. Put it in your spirit. Put it in your heart. Put it in your mind. Amen. Behold the fowls of the air, 626 says of Matthew. They sow not, neither do they reap. Yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are you not much better than they? Sometimes because of just the way life is, it's hard to comprehend that Jesus loves us as his children. You know, why? 
Why, why do people sometimes have trouble with that? Because for a lot of people, they did not have a good earthly father in their life. They did not have a, a parentage in their life that would take care of all their needs. Amen. They grew up in fear. They grew up in worry. As a child, I wonder if I'm going to eat today. I wonder if I'm going to have a place to live today. And so when they come into the church... They just automatically bring that garbage and that junk with them into the church, and they, they, they connect it with God. God is our heavenly Father. We are his children. Well, if my earthly father did not meet my need, then probably my heavenly Father is not going to meet my need. And so it, it is a, a problem in their life. But even those of us that may have had good parents, and, and they loved us, and they took care of us, we even still wrestle with that because in our society... In our society, we are taught that you are to take control of your life. You are to be the center focal point of your life. You are to do it yourself. But we need to understand that we've got to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. So why worry? Amen. Jesus, amen, paints a different picture of our Heavenly Father. He shows us of a picture of one that takes care of the birds and adorn the flowers and loves us even more and even cares for us even more. And even despite our sinfulness and our hard-headedness and sometimes our spirit of rebellion, amen, God loves you and I deeply and he values us deeply as well. Let us seek first the kingdom of God. Let us draw closer to the cross and allow him to become the focal point of our life. And then as we begin to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. That wonderful, that wonderful truth will change our perspective and then it will begin to ease our worry. Jesus illustrated this, as I've already said, by two basic needs of the human existence, that is food and clothing. Food and clothing. Amen. And so when we are not seeking first the kingdom of God, a lack of trust, a lack of trust in who? Ourself? Well, if we had the trust in ourself, then we have reason to worry. But when we begin to trust God, amen, we Submit ourselves and give ourselves to him. So Jesus said, don't be like the Gentiles because worrying is a, is a mindset of the heathen nation, of the physical people, of the physical realm, of the natural man. Amen. So this is what he's saying. Don't be like the Gentiles. They don't have no ability to trust in God. They don't know God. They have not experienced God. You serve a God that rolled back the Red Sea. You serve a God that delivered you, amen, out of the land of Egypt. You serve a God that when Jesus was, amen, walking the shores of Galilee, amen, people knew that Jesus brought them out of the captivity of the Babylonians and reestablished them into the promise land fulfilling. Amen. The prophets of Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Isaiah's word. So they knew all this. But what did the Gentiles have? All they had was their bells. All they had was their heathen gods that did not answer prayer. And so don't let the mindset of a pagan idolatry or a pagan religion, if you will, to, to fixate your heart and your mind. Amen. But begin to look to Jesus, who is the author and finisher of your faith. Amen. Because Jesus is the source of everything. I said Jesus is the source of everything that we need. The Gentile mind, the pagan mind, it, it pre preaches a gospel that you have the ability to provide for yourself. And thank God that God has given you strength and has given you ability, amen, to meet needs. He has given you the, the ability to do a job that you can do, amen. But we associate here in America the Christian dream with the American dream. Yeah. What, is, what is the American dream? Well, it was at one time two cars in every garage, A full refrigerator full of food. 
living in a nice home in a nice subdivision somewhere in a suburb on the edge of a great metropolitan city. And so when we see that coming together in our life or not coming together in our life, as it has been preached and propagated through the media and just through teaching, amen, then we feel inadequate. We feel like, well, God has failed me and God has let me down. God never said that you're going to have two cars in every garage. God said, I'll meet your need. Oh, it's nice to have two vehicles. I don't have to chauffeur my wife around. My wife doesn't have to chauffeur me around. But, you know, if we had to go back to one car, it would be hard, but I could do it. I could do it. Would I like to do it? Probably not, but I, I could do it. You know, it, wa it wasn't, think about it for a moment. It wasn't that long ago that none of us had one of these. I remember, amen, some of you should remember this, that when, uh, what, what did they call them? The tape machines, uh, the phone answering system came out. It was a little tape machine that had the little cassette tapes. You recorded on one tape and it played back. Amen. And it recorded the message. Man, we thought we were living. And that was when the phone was either on the wall or sat on a table somewhere, much less not in your pocket. And then when the, when the first cell phones came out, amen, they, they, were, they, they, they called them bad phones. How, rem how many of you remember that? Oh, I remember mid-90s. We moved to Statesboro, Georgia, a friend of mine, let me use his. Man, I thought I was living, I thought I was living the rifle of Raleigh. Here it was. But you know, home area was within 30 miles of Statesboro, Georgia. And you only had 30 minutes of free airtime. Then after that, it was so much money, amen, per minute. And then they started free nights and weekends. We all thought everything was great then. But now, you know, you've got unlimited usage with unlimited data. And if they went back to the way it was 20, 25 years ago, people would be screaming and crying because they wouldn't know what to do. But you know what? We got along just fine without them. We got along just fine without them. Now, I'm not saying I'm going to throw mine in the garbage tomorrow because it has become a very nice convenience to have. But it's, it's not a necessity. It's not a necessity. So what I am showing, what I'm trying to tell you, amen, the American dream is not necessarily what Christ has for us. Amen. But what he does have, he'll say, I will supply all your needs. I will supply all your needs according to the riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Amen. What we do, though, we allow the things that we want and the things that we have to define who we are. No, what we need to do is allow Jesus to define who we are. And then allow Jesus, amen, to give us what we need. Amen. Somebody shout amen. amen. So how do we achieve how to how do we amen really get things in order amen understand that the possessions that you possess do not satisfy you only Jesus satisfies you so begin to seek first the kingdom of God begin to trust in God amen begin to believe that God is going to do what is best for us amen and he even gave us the greatest amen answer to our need and that was the cross that we were on our way to a hell fire and brimstone we were on our way to eternal separation from God but yet he became the lamb that would sacrifice his life he was the one that shed his blood that I could repent of my sins I could be back in Jesus' name. I can be filled with the Holy Ghost that I can enjoy life and have life more abundantly and I can make heaven my home. And if my God did that for me, amen, for my tomorrow and for my eternity, don't I think and don't you think that he can take care of my needs in the next 24 hours? Amen. Why worry? All right. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you worry about your eternity? Do you worry where you're going to spend eternity? Do you worry if you're going to make heaven? Or do you worry if you're going to end up in hell? I, 
I would wager that probably most of us here today would say, not worried about it because I'm good. I have the peace of mind. I have the peace of heart that God is going to take care of me. And I'm glad that you have that peace of mind. I'm glad you have that peace of heart that God is going to take care of you. And so if we have that same mind, if we have that peace of mind and peace of heart that God is going to take care of us for eternity, then can we not understand and have that same peace of mind and have that same peace of heart, amen, that God's going to take care of me right now. God's going to take care of me today. God's going to take care of me tonight. God's going to take care of me tomorrow. God's going to take care of me on Tuesday. God's going to take care of me on Wednesday. So why should I worry? Why should I worry? Why should should I worry? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these things shall be added unto you. So our trust should be placed in Jesus because he knows not only our greatest need, that is salvation, but he knows, amen, what I need in this life. You know, God provided the perfect lamb for an imperfect people. Amen. And we don't have to do anything to obtain that provision except receive it and believe it in faith and then respond to him through repentance and water baptism in Jesus' name. And then God fills us with the Holy Ghost. And we put our faith and we put our trust in him that God's going to meet that need so I can make heaven my home. So if we can do that then why can we not trust God to take care of our daily needs and our daily provisions? Did he not say in the Gospel of Matthew, part of the uh, Sermon on the Mount, when he did the, the Lord's Prayer, he said, Give us this day our daily bread. Pray. Ask God to supply your need. Pray. And let God make a way where there seems to be no way. Come on, somebody say amen. We're talking about seeking first the kingdom of God. We're talking about, amen, trusting God, putting ourselves in the place that worry no longer controls our mind. It no longer dictates to the spirit of our heart that I don't have to worry. Seek first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. You know, when we... Say, I am trusting him and I am believing him for my eternity. And we repent and we're baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. We are trusting him, amen, for the greatest need of our life. And if we're trusting him for the greatest need in our life, don't you think we could trust him for the things that are a lot smaller? Like what we are going to eat, like what we are going to wear. Amen. And so since God has taken care of our biggest need, we can fully trust him to take care of the smaller needs in our life. So we need to understand that, amen, when our life is centered in Christ, we find all our need, and he hears our requests. The psalmist David said in Psalm 66, 18 through 20, he declares this, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. But verily God hath heard me, verse number 19. He hath obtained to the voice of my prayer. Blessed be God, which hath not turned away my prayer, nor his mercy from me. So can we not begin to trust God? Can we not begin to cry out to God? Can we not begin to make our need known to God and quit worrying? Seek first the kingdom of God. God doesn't have a providing problem. Amen. I said God doesn't have a providing problem. You have a limited amount in your checkbook. You have a limited amount in your savings. You have a limited amount on credit cards if you have such a thing. But my God does not have a providing problem. For the psalmist said in Psalms 50, verses 10 through 15, he said, for every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills, they belong to him. I know all the fowls of the mountain and the wild beasts of the field are mine. He said, if I were hungry, stating that he's never hungry, I would not tell you why. Because you can't meet my need. Because the world is mine and the fullness thereof is mine. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? 
Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High and call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Amen. So trust him. He owns the cattle. And another scripture says he owns all the gold and silver underneath all those thousand hills. So if God does, God can make a way. God, come on, hear me today. God will see you through. Why worry? Why worry? Why worry? Trust God because your worrying is not going to change the end of the result. It's just going to make matters worse. And you know what else? God does not have a timing problem. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord. Oh, we all know this, with all thy heart and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall, he shall, he shall direct thy path. It doesn't say when he'll do it. He just says he'll do it. He doesn't have a timing problem. Amen. The Bible says in Galatians 4, 4, when Jesus was born, he came in the fullness of time. He came in the fullness of time. God has a divinely appointed time. Amen. And God will answer prayer, and God will make a way where there seems to be no way. So why should we worry? Why should we be frustrated? Amen. Because we cannot control what we can't control. But God can. I said God can. I said, God can. If there is a problem, it's with us. And it's a faith problem. Did he not say, oh, you of little faith, in our scripture reading, why do you worry? Why do you worry? Why do you worry? He said it in Matthew 6.30. Amen. Oh, ye of little faith. You know, we, we think, we say, well, I want to have great faith. I want to believe God for the cancers. I want to believe God, amen, for the blood sugars being healed and the high blood pressure and the blinded eyes to be open. That's awesome. Let's believe God. Let's watch God do it. But let's also watch God supply us with some Oscar Mayer bologna and bread if we need it, with some mustard and mayonnaise and a tomato to go on top of it. Not a big deal to God. You hear me? Not a big deal to God. Worry is simply a product of not trusting God by not seeking first the kingdom of God. And so the good news is that we don't have to stay that way. The good news is we don't have to live that way. You may say, well, brother, use a pan. You don't understand my worry. You're right. I don't. And I'm just going to be honest with you. There are times that when I worry... I don't understand my worry. So if we don't understand it, why don't we just trust him? Why don't we just believe him? Why don't we just lean upon him? You know, I, I don't know the particulars of things that you worry about, but I know my God can, and my God does. He is sovereign. He is in charge. He knows all. He can do all. He is still on his throne. So what it boils down is, I've got a choice. I can worry or I can trust him. You can't do both. There's no room in your life for both. You either worry or you either trust God. So Jesus once again gave us the answer, Matthew 6, 33, 34. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take no thought for tomorrow. Don't worry about tomorrow. Why? Because... Tomorrow may not ever come for us. Think about it like this. If you're worrying about tomorrow and the rapture takes place today, you're in the rapture, what good is worrying about tomorrow? Take no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is evil thereof. So seek. What does this word seek first mean? It means to desire. It means to pursue first. Let it be the foremost thing. Let it be the first thing in your spirit. You know, we are not seeking something that's hidden. Amen. But we are pursuing the things of God with a passion. And it ought to be our highest priority. It ought to be the number one priority within our heart and within our life. So what, what does it look like? Matthew 6, 19 through 21. I've quoted it just a few moments ago, but now let's read it. Lay up. 
Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Amen. But he said, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Verse number 21. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. There was a headline, and I did not read it. But I saw it early this morning. It said, is the money in the bank yours, or does it belong to the bank? Is the money in the bank yours, or does it belong to the bank? And, you know, that's a, that's a good question. We, we would automatically assume, well, it's my money. I put it there. But yet if they freeze your accounts, guess what? You can't get at it. Well, I'll buy gold. You know, there's a lot of promotion right now about buying gold and silver, these hard assets that never lose their value, that will always have value. That's true. But remember what happened in the early 30s? They outlawed owning gold. And every American had to turn in their gold to the government. And if you were found holding gold of any type, even gold coins, you were penalized. You were prosecuted. So what we have as far as a physical asset, even though we may claim it to be ours, in reality, is it really ours? Because if it's really ours, then nobody can take it away. So what is ours? What belongs to us? It is the life that Jesus has given to me. It is, it is the promises that my God has given to me, that where my treasure is, there will my heart be also. Nobody, I said nobody can take it away. Not even the devil can take it away from you. And don't allow yourself to, come on, don't allow yourself to show you, sell yourself short and let it slip between your fingers. Hold on to the word of God. Hold on to the promises of God. Stand strong on the word of God. Why worry? Why worry? Seek first the kingdom of God. What is a kingdom? A kingdom is a, a, a geographic region. Amen. One's kingdom is that region in, in which uh, people or things, uh, people have control over things or, or authority. And so we need to understand that the kingdom of God is that area in which God has control over everything. And if I am in the kingdom of God, my God is going to have control over me. Amen. It is the realm where God exists, where the realm God exerts control and authority. So if God exerts control and authority in my life and I'm seeking first the kingdom of God, don't you think that God can take care of you? Don't you think that God can meet your needs? So why worry? So Jesus is teaching us and showing us that it does not matter what age that we live in. I'm not talking about how old we are, but the times that we live in, that if we will surrender ourselves to God's will, and we are yielding ourselves and, and seeking Him and giving priority to seeking God's kingdom and righteousness, then my God, my God will supply all my needs. Jesus said once again, Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew 6, 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. Then all these things shall be added unto you. Your life, your heart, your mind is centered on Jesus Christ. So let's not be so consumed with temporary things of this world. Let us be consumed with the desire and the things of God. Amen. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, if you then be risen in Christ. In other words, if you are born again, you have that new life within inside of you. Seek those things which are above. Seek those things which are above where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. And set your affection on things above, not on the things of the earth. Because if we seek him, if we long for him, if we focus after him, then the things of the earth God will give to us. Amen. Now, I'm not saying and I'm not inferring that God's going to give you everything that you want. But what I am saying 
And what I am inferring is God will give you everything that you need. Because each day has trouble on its own. Amen. Let me read this scripture to you. Matthew 6, 34. Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. What is Jesus telling us? He's saying don't worry or be anxious about tomorrow because tomorrow is going to have its own worries and anxieties of, it own, of its own. So why carry the worries over to, to tomorrow and just compound the worry and compound the anxiety? Because each day has its own trouble. So I'm living today. I'm going to trust God. I'm living today. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. I, I'm, I'm living today, and I'm going to set my heart and my throne, uh, my will, upon the will of Almighty God. You know, we cannot escape the troubled day because Jesus said, in this world you shall have tribulation. Amen. But through it all, I'm going to focus upon him. I'm going to make him first. I, I'm going to love him. I'm going to trust him. Without a focus upon Jesus... Without a focus upon Jesus, it's easy to be terrified. And so we have a decision to make. We have a decision to make. Will we be paralyzed by fear and worry about tomorrow's unknowns? Or even the unknowns of today? Because we don't know what's going to happen in the next hour, the next two hours, the next three hours. Or we can make this choice, I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God. I'm going to lay up treasures in heaven. I am going to magnify my Jesus. It's a daily choice to trust the sovereign and living God. And then when I truly trust him and I, I truly begin to seek the kingdom of God, then I am putting myself in a place that I'm not going to worry. I don't have to worry. I don't have to bring myself down to worry. Remember what I said a few moments ago. When you are overwhelmed, let God overwhelm your overwhelming situation. Amen. Because he will do it. He will do it. Because God is greater than any situation. God is greater than any problem that we will ever face. So why worry? Why worry? We don't have to. We don't want to. We can simply channel, and if you want to use this word, channel that energy, channel that effort from worrying and seeking the face of God, seeking the kingdom of God. We will find that way and that road is a much better path. And everybody say amen. Let's stand. Let's lift our hands and let's love the Lord as Sister Kicklighter begins to sing. Let's worship the Lord right now.